Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 414, the post GAFCON analysis. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's June 29th, 2018. Okay, George, welcome back. How are you feeling? Are you back in your time zone now? Uh, I don't know what time zone I am in. It's 39 <laughs> hours from leaving the apartment in Jerusalem to getting in my bed in Florida. Uh, planes, trains, automobiles uh, sure. concluded with a, uh, a two and a half hour car ride from the Atlanta air from the Orlando airport to my house. Don't live in the sticks, Kevin. That's my advice. That's a long way to go. I, I don't live in the sticks. For me, uh, flying on a JFK, uh, it's a 10 hour flight uh, into Tel Aviv coming back and I did the planes trains and automobiles too because Mrs. Carlson is kind of tired of taking Kevin to the airport so if I'm going on a longer trip like a week uh, I have to devise a way and for me out here in Milford I take the train down to Grand Central I take the bus from Grand Central into um, JFK and if I get there early enough I catch my flight yay so lots of fun um, we're back and it's time to do some analysis uh, about what happened in GAFCON and I know I've said this in a couple other episodes, GAFCON has matured. And I also think Africa has matured. Um, how our response to Africa. And I thought that'd be kind of interesting to talk about uh, over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, would you agree that this is a, a more mature organization than uh, GAFCON 1 and 2? Yes, and I would also add that some of their opponents have matured while well, others have proven to be grossly immature. <laughs> we'll get into all that fun stuff. Sure. I'm going to adjust the sound a little. It looks like I'm bouncing on the bottom here. Moving on up. Can you hear me now? Good. All right. I can hear you now. <laughs> you want to start over? No, no. We're not starting over. This is just okay. how, you know, unscripted works. I do adjustments. Uh, you do your lean back thing and your lean forward thing. And, you know, people get used to it. Um, so, GAFCON 1. We showed up in Jerusalem. I, you were there as a reporter. I was there as a reporter. I videotaped it. And I remember the desire to appeal to the conscience of Rowan Williams. Rowan, look, we need your help. Um, obviously, the panel orphans and all that stuff never worked. But look at this big organization uh, responding to what's happening in America, Canada, England, and all over the world. Things are going haywire. We notice, but we want to do something about it. Rowan, can you help? GAFCON 2, uh, Justin Welby showed up, thankfully. And uh, in, in showing up, Justin said, I can hear you, but I'm really here for the Westgate Mall thing. <laughs> I don't, I'm not actually going to go visit the Westgate. No, but I'm that's what I'm here for. I'm not going to visit any of the victims, but that's why I'm here. And oh, by the way, I'm also going to stop and say hello to GAFCON. It's so weird that you guys have GAFCON right next to where the Westgate Mall terrorist attack happened. So I'm going to say hi. And, but there was still that we, we want to appeal to the instruments of unity. We want to appeal to Justin Welby because we believe, at least at that time, um, working together with Canterbury is the best way forward. GAFCON 3 notes, not so much, George. Absolutely. See, lots of layers and layers of this. Mm -hmm. uh, GAFCON 1 and GAFCON 2 sought to bring the Archbishop of Canterbury on side. GAFCON 3 uh, was, under the, was under the firm belief that it'd be nice if he was on side, but he's irrelevant to our salvation, and he's irrelevant to the Anglican way. Mm -hmm. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury, as the first among equals of the Anglican Communion, is an idea that's only about 100, 150 years old. Uh, it is not something that arose out of the Reformation. It only arose at the, uh, at the height of the British Empire, when the Archbishop of Canterbury would issue this call to the bishops around the world, plus the Americans, to come. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, so that's a modern innovation. Mm -hmm. And what the Africans have understood is that uh, that the winds of change, as Harold McMillan once said, have blown through the Anglican world. And they need no longer identify themselves with an office or a man. They identify themselves with the faith once received, the Book of Common Prayer, and Scripture. And it's this transformation has been helped by the intransigence and basic dishonesty 
of Justin Welby. That they realize they're waving out the rearview mirror to Justin Welby as they're driving off. Their churches are thriving. Uh, the ACNA is thriving. Uh, evangelical parts of the Episcopal Church are thriving. Don't tell anybody. No. Well, but, but the old ways are dead. Absolutely dead. I can't think and they of. They don't need Welby anymore. I can't think of one GAFCON primate or Global South primate that had not written a personal letter appealing to Roland Williams or appealing to Justin Welby. Maybe not so much Justin Welby. Um, they were fully interested in working through that instrument. Um, they had written the Queen. Uh, I've talked to archbishops who've personally written the, the Queen because they were not getting a response from uh, Canterbury or Lambeth or uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and they wanted to appeal uh, to a, a more direct higher power. Um, and so there was a desire before to work within the system. That desire is no longer there. Kevin, do you remember the closing press conference? I think it was a German, uh, it, was, it was a reporter. Sure. I think it was a German fellow who asked uh, Nicholas Oko, the Archbishop of Nigeria, have you appealed to Justin Welby? Have you appealed to the Queen? And Oko gave a very telling answer. He basically said, we've informed Welby. We no longer appeal to Welby. And no, the Queen's got nothing to do with anything anymore. Now, what does this mean? I'm wow. not saying anything mean about the Queen. Oh, yeah. What I'm trying to say is that the old colonialist, imperialist worldview that the Church of England was there to support our little brown brothers and black brothers and yellow brothers and hillbilly brothers in America, find the way to truth and light, that is gone. It is. That is dead. And that's my reference to mature Africa. Okay, they, they've come a long way in not, uh, now, not all of Africa, but GAFCON Africa is no longer concerned uh, with how uh, uh, Canterbury feels about them. The uh, one of the major accomplishments of the conference was the, the promulgation of nine networks. Now that's a bit of a snooze, frankly, from a news perspective. You know, you dutifully write up the story, but you realize nobody's going to read it. No. no, but it really is important. Now the Anglican Consultative Council has networks which are utterly irrelevant to the life of the church. They're basically quangos so that uh, privileged people can jet set off to other parts of the world and talk to other uh, people, but they don't do anything. They don't mean anything. Uh, GAFCON is setting up their own networks, theological education, priestly formation, uh, development. And the point of these networks is not to compete. They have nothing to compete with. Rather, is to accomplish the work of the church. And so they're not relying on Canterbury. It's irrelevant to their life. There's a nostalgia, there's a romanticism, there's this sort of fun of travel to go to England. But at the end of the day, holding in one hand their salvation and in the other their uh, uh, ability to jump off to England for a two-week junket every 10 years. They'll choose salvation. And that's the true thing here. I think at some point Canterbury has to wake up and realize that people are willing to fund themselves and travel to go to GAFCON rather than go to Lambeth for free on Canterbury's dime. And the th- the, here's the joke. The dimes are arising. Yeah. The Nigerians, believe it or not, have a lot of money. Uh, 22 million members, including a few bi- oil billionaires here and there, they can... It's no longer the West doling out cash to get people to do so. In some areas, that still continues. There are parts of the Anglican world that are wholly reliant upon subsidies from the Western Church. And then there are other... The Anglican Church Brazil, for instance, is thriving with no subsidies from anybody. Yeah. Rather, the Holy Spirit seems to be moving amongst them. It's, it's, it's incredible. So that's GAFCON. Let's talk specifically about the response to GAFCON. Um, if you're looking for the response from the Archbishop of Canterbury, I'll pray for you in a tweet. Um, I didn't get any response. You know, I, I were in the press room with Gavin, and um, very little outside response, George. Well, we need to say that uh, during the conference, uh, Lambeth Palace was following everything very closely. Mm-hmm. They were not unaware. 
but they chose not to respond other than uh, Justin Welby's rather passive-aggressive tweet. Now, Welby is passive-aggressive. He's not, well, that's just the way he is. The the delegates had uh, discussed the first draft of the communique, which basically slashes, well, cuts Welby off the knees. While they're all at the Temple Mount, Welby tweets out a a first his first response is sort of one of these anemic. Well, I pray for your discernment or wisdom. Now we have some rather unsophisticated viewers and readers who say, "Well, oh, isn't that sweet and kind?" I don't think well, any of our don't... viewers are unsophisticated. However, well, they... in the grand well, scheme but... of things, there's some people well, who it... say. Well, if you would take that in isolation, and English is your fifth language, you could think that. Okay. But if you actually speak English as the English speak it, which I don't, I mean, if you ask Gavin Ashenden what that meant, it was a savage. It, it, it was Darth it's, it's Vader like saying, that, pray that I don't alter our agreement further. <laughs> I mean, how, how, I think people shouldn't hear this in the little sense of in an American context, have you had the church lady say, I'll pray for you, which means buzz off. Or it's it's a, it's a put down. Yeah, sure. I'll pray for your discernment. You, you get these people in prayer meetings who say, "Lord, I pray that that lady right there stops drinking." She's not praying to God. She's there to gossip and to be unkind. Justin Welby's passive aggressive response uh, was extraordinary in its untimeliness, its lack of maturity and wisdom and its ability to make a situation worse for himself. See, one of the things that I found fascinating in talking to the GAFCON primates, what really put them over the edge was the invitation to Michael Curry to preach at the royal wedding by yeah. Justin Welby. That was now, it. Now, we've discussed this, we've discussed the content of the sermon, the politics of the sermon. We've not really discussed how this was a Catalyst. Poke in the eye, yeah, the catalyst, catalyst. Yeah. Uh, for for the Gafcon movement. People who had been on the fence hopped off the fence and joined, rallied around the flag. Because and the reason why it's nothing to do with Michael Curry as a person, nothing to do with the content of his sermon, but rather Justin Welby said there'd be the three-year timeout uh, for the Episcopal Church. And then he, then he proceeded to break that with the ACC meeting and Lusaka and so on and so forth. But Welby always had these arguments that, oh, well, legally I couldn't do this. Oh, well, that was not my decision. Oh, well. So when the time came where it was his decision, what did he do? Oh. He folded. Yeah. He, he showed his word meant nothing. Now, I am not saying that Justin Welby is a liar. I don't know the man. But what I am saying is that talking to archbishops and primates from around the world, they regard him as a passive-aggressive twit. Yeah, yeah. Someone whose word is not worth anything. I I was amazed when speaking to uh, archbishops and bishops, uh, the lack of respect that Justin Welby has earned himself. Uh, and it's different. They, dis they disagreed profoundly with Rowan Williams. Mm-hmm. But they recognized him in him a spiritual maturity and a great deal of fog. Sure. But there's not the personal tinge with Rowan Williams no, as mean, there was with he. Justin Welby is probably the one person that can make you miss Rowan Williams. Um, it is what it is. Let's talk a little bit, um, finishing up here, about Gafcon England. Uh, GAFCON 2, at the very end, in the communique, was the desire for GAFCON to take to the shores of England and offer an alternative to those who were suffering under, and let's just be honest, some of the oppression happening uh, within the uh, Church of England. And we heard, I'll, I'll give you an example sure. of that oppression so that our, our people, our viewers can understand what we're talking about. There was a convert from Islam. Uh, an Iranian, a Persian. He converted to Christianity. He felt called to the ordained ministry and went through the process in the Church of England. He went through seminary, was ordained, and was sent and was offered a job at 
a cathedral in the north of England. The cathedral already had a Muslim imam on staff, and the cathedral asked that the men not be set there because it would upset the imam. Okay, so the man is then placed in a parish setting under a partnered gay man. Priest is a partnered gay man. The the deacon, the, this man, new priest talks to his wife and said, you know, this is really problematic for me because yeah. this is a flamboyant, out, openly gay, none of this wink, wink, nod, nod crap that the Church of England likes to pretend exists. And so the bishop moved him. He moved him to serve as the curate under the Grand Master Chaplain of the Freemasons. And he that so the curate went back and said, Look, I mean I've been I've been blackballed because I'm an ex Muslim, I'll offend Muslims. I was sent to a gay parish, now I'm sent to a Grand Master Freemason. And the bishop, who is considered a conservative in the Church of England, said, Well, I can't help you go away. And here's the bigger problem. There's multiple churches that fit those descriptions. It's not like uh, they only had one imam they could send him to or one gay priest they could send him to or one mason they could send him to. These churches are full of this, George. Absolutely. And with, so Gafkin too basically said, okay, in England you do what has been done in America. And what we learned both officially and unofficially is it's not working in England. Mm -hmm. Why is it not working in England? Because the cats will not be herded in one direction. The This was not said publicly, and GAFCON will continue to stand by what it has done, but I think there's a, mis a realization that they made a mistake in the approach they took of appointing one bishop to oversee a diverse coalition of, Anglo of sacramentalists and free churchmen of, of all these people and they picked a, and they picked someone who doesn't have what it takes. Uh, when we went to some of the English gatherings, actually, we were ejected from some of the English. <laughs> we gatherings. were kicked out by the English. I was so humiliated. <laughs> we were, uh, you know, I have, I have never been kicked out of a, an integrity meeting, which is the gay lobby at the Episcopal Church, and they know who I am. Don't you worry. <laughs> But the, the English people kick us out because, oh, you're press. What about that press and that press and that press? Oh, but you're real press. Yeah, you'll real actually, press. You'll you're, actually tell the truth about tell what's the happening. Truth. They, they literally almost said, well, you'll tell the truth. <laughs> well, what, happened, what was happening is that you go around and you've got 100 people in a room with 98 opinions. Yeah. And nobody will follow. And so on the fight and various ideas were floated and programs mm -hmm. laid out and on the last night they all gathered together as many as them could uh, and they agree and they couldn't agree and what happened was Andy Lines the uh, ACNA uh, bishop serving in England basically said I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do and you can follow me or not and guess what <laughs> they're not following him <laughs> well, some, and, well obviously some are uh, but uh, you know the majority is still looking for a solution and you get a hundred English people in a room you're gonna have 500 solutions but here's the good news mm -hmm. we, we're not pushing any particular outcome I other than a good yeah. one yeah other than a good one well I'm pushing a particular outcome but I can't where I'm pushing uh, or seeking the best for the Church of England and what we're hearing from the primates council is that yeah, we hear what you're saying. We know what you're saying is true. We don't want to embarrass ourselves by undoing what we've done, but let's shake the box and upend all the pieces and see what settles again. So I'm not, it's not hopeless, but it's, it's in a quagmire right now. And as rough as this may be for some GAFCON people to hear, uh, especially leadership, um, GAFCON's mature enough that we're not going to, you know, uh, hear a lot of complaint about their support, uh, which is it, it which can, is different let, than GAFCON one. Let me let me uh, give an analogy uh, mm -hmm. before the uh, leak blower gets too close to your yeah. Your well, gee, that and I got to run to my appointment in six minutes. So let, well, let's let's finish up. Let's go on. Come on. The Sudanese woman bishop issue mm -hmm. that had the potential to blow up GAFCON. They handled it well. Not everybody agreed with how they handled it. No. And the 
And thank God the South Sudanese delegation had visa problems so that woman couldn't come to GAFCON and vest as a bishop. And so nobody had to say to her, don't come. Thankfully, the uh, government is so dysfunctional in South Sudan, they couldn't make it. Yeah. Reworking how they approach the situation in England is of, of a magnitude far less than the woman bishop from South Sudan. I agree. They survived that. They can survive uh, rethinking their way forward. All right. He's coming my way. I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 414 of Anglican Unscripted.